going to be a pretty good continuation of what we talked about last week. And I would like for your prayers as I address you from the topic, the meaning of worth. Now, we human beings tend to put worth in the most intriguing things, in the most interesting things. You know, a piece of pressurized coal can go for thousands, if not millions of dollars, and wars are fought over them, and limbs are lost. I'm talking about diamonds, if you, if you don't know. Amen. Diamonds are pressurized coal. Amen. <laughs> you know, when we run for miles on end, risking sore muscles the next day, or we're like Eric, or we, we do insanity at the asylum for no reason whatsoever, to the point where we might want, want, want to lose our lunch, lose the contents of our stomach, amen? At the end of it, we say it was worth it. By contrast, when we eat something really delicious, perhaps a a, a slice of the Diva chocolate cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory, you whose, whose caloric value is more than a day's worth of calories that one human being should consume in an entire 24 hour period. After we eat that cheesecake, we say, eh, it was worth it. <laughs> we make similar value judgments on our fellow human beings, right? When we read in the news about a criminal who might have, I don't know, killed or molested children, we say, fry them. They don't deserve to live. They're not worthy to live. When a small child or a pillar of the community, they get sick and they pass away, we're upset because we don't believe that they deserve to die. They didn't deserve to die. You remember Charles Ramsey from Ohio from Cleveland, back in April, was it? He rescued three women who had been kidnapped a decade earlier. You, know, you remember Charles Ramsey now. Yeah, he, he was eating his McDonald's, minding his own business when you know the girl was knocking on the door. Well, everyone was hailing him as a hero for rescuing these girls from his next, from his next door neighbor. And then it later came out that he had had his own run-ins with the law in the past. And so now suddenly he wasn't such a hero anymore. You know, suddenly he wasn't worthy of that title to some people. His past, for whatever reason, negated the good that he'd done. Church, what makes somebody worthy? What makes someone worthy? There's an account in Luke of a Roman centurion. He's a military commander. And his slave had become gravely ill, almost to the point of death. And so he sends the Jewish elders to ask Jesus on his behalf if he would heal his servant for him. Now, the Jewish elders, they do a little bit more than that. They go a little bit further, and they don't just ask Jesus, but they are sure to tell Jesus, tell Jesus about everything the centurion has done for them. He was the one who built our synagogue for us, Jesus. He loves the Jewish people. He is worthy of your help because of all that he does. They made the case for why Jesus should help this man and this man's slave. He's a good guy. He deserves it. He's a good man. In their estimation, it was the right thing to do because he was someone who was absolutely worthy of Jesus' help. Jesus, assumingly at least, is moved by their recounts of the centurion's goodness, and he makes his way to go help the man. But a funny thing happened on the way to the healing. The centurion sends a messenger to Jesus to tell Jesus not to bother coming. Don't bother coming. Now, it's not that he didn't want Jesus' help. It's just that despite the Jewish elders' glowing recommendation of the centurion, the centurion didn't believe that he was worthy for Jesus to step foot in his house. He didn't think he was worthy. That's why he sent the elders on his behalf, because he didn't want to be presumptuous and come to Jesus himself. How could he? He was a Gentile. Why would Jesus ever listen to him? He was unworthy. But he was smart enough to recognize the power, the authority 
that rested in Jesus. He had a little bit of it himself. You know, he commanded a lot of a lot of men. When he told them to go, they went. When he told them to come here, they came here. The word he uses is exousia. The Greek word exousia. That means judicial authority, administrative authority. Basically, the power to tell somebody what to do. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you laughed a little bit too hard at that. <laughs> They, they, would, they would listen to him when he spoke. They wouldn't try to talk their way out of their orders. They recognized the authority of the person giving them the orders. And they did what he told. And he knew that Jesus also had this exousia, this power, this, and that Jesus' jurisdiction extended his own. He's way more powerful than he is. He knew that all Jesus had to do was say the word. And his servant would be healed. That's it. That's all Jesus would have to do. And surely, before that messenger got back to the house, that servant was healed. He was healed. Look at the contrast happening here. You see the contrast. The Jewish elders go to Jesus on the centurion's behalf. And their strategy is to regale Jesus with tales of how good this man is. Not only in their estimation is he worthy of help, but he should be worthy of help in Jesus' estimation, too. And they tell him why Jesus should help him. He's a good God. Their reasoning was very Jewish. If you did good things, then you deserve God's blessings. You earn God's blessings. To them, it was the man's good deeds that made him worthy. But what really mattered to Jesus? What really mattered to Jesus? Jesus, by contrast, is moved by the man's faith. He's moved by his faith. Not only did he understand who Jesus was, but he understood what Jesus could do. He wasn't reliant on his history with the Jewish people. He wasn't standing on that, 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 those, those laurels. He wasn't resting on his laurels. The only thing he had to depend on was Christ's power, and the only ground on which he had to stand was the solid rock of Jesus Christ, and he hoped that to Jesus that would be enough. And you know what? It was enough. It was enough. Jesus turned to the crowd, to those very same Jews who spoke of the centurion's goodness and his worthiness. And he told them, I haven't seen this kind of faith even in all of Israel. Do you get that diss? Do you get that rebuke? That spoke loudly to me. You know what Jesus was saying? Jesus was saying, Israel, Israel, Israel. You mean to tell me that my father handed you the law in person, gave you his law in his hand, in your hands, and yet you don't even know your own God well enough to have the kind of faith that this Roman Gentile is showing right now? He clearly believes more deeply than any of you. You're going to let him upstage you like that? Really, Israel? You really thought that a person could depend on his own goodness without ever once exercising their faith in the one with more power than them, more exousia than them? Really, Israel? Really? You think you could do this all by yourself? You think you could just do everything the right way and it will all fall into place for you? Did you really think that as long as you had your ducks in a row that you wouldn't need me? Really? Before Paul could lay it out in his epistles, and before John Calvin fleshed out the doctrine centuries later during the Reformation, Jesus shows us in this account that we are justified not by what we do, but by our faith. We're justified by our faith. No, the centurion wasn't worthy. He wasn't worthy. And he at least had the sense to know that. Nothing he did was ever going to be enough to force God's hand. Nothing he could ever do would make God move on his behalf. He couldn't maneuver God. He could only come in faith understanding that whether or not things panned out the way he wanted them to, God was still God. 
and God was still going to be powerful. Notice that Jesus, I want you to notice something. Jesus had always possessed this exousia. All he ever had to do was just say the word and the servant would, would have been healed the whole time. That's all it would have taken. He went along with the Jewish elders after they convinced him to go, but he didn't act until he saw the faith of the centurion. That's when he acted. I believe that was as much for the Jews that were surrounding him as it was for the centurion and his slave. And you know what? It's for us as well. That was for us to see as well. The original question was, what makes someone worthy? Short answer is nothing. Nothing makes us worthy. Not a thing we can do can ever make us worthy of every blessing we ever receive from God. And yet, God gives it to us freely. Freely. We could build entire cities for the homeless. We could cook our neighbor's dinner every night. We could pick up all the litter around the neighborhood school. But what truly gets God's attention is our faith. Faith. God is moved when we come to understand that no matter what we've done, good or bad, we don't have a leg to stand on that is nearly as stable as the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Our faith is an acknowledgement that we cannot do this thing called life alone. It's an acknowledgement of the unique power and ability of God to step into our circumstances. If we could do it on our own, God would have left us to our own devices, but God did not. God sent the word and then sent it again in flesh for us to dwell among us. We never have to earn God's favor. We never have to earn worth in God's eyes. If sending the only begotten of the Father doesn't show us how much God values us, I don't know what does. I don't know what does. Our worth is found in God's eyes alone, and it can be proven in the person of Jesus Christ who thought it worth it to die for us. God thought that was worth it. Believe that today. Believe that God loves you ridiculously and for no reason. Believe that God loves you not for what you do, but for what you are to him. Have faith in the God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can think or imagine and be convinced of that same God's love for you today. God loves you. Tell your neighbor you're worthy. You're worthy. And not because you're just so great and perfect. Because that's what God says. Amen. 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 Gracious and eternal God, we come to you acknowledging that we have holes. We're inconsistent. Our character, our integrity isn't consistent, Lord God. It isn't the greatest. It isn't the strongest, Lord. We're porous. We're fragile. We're, we're fallible, Lord. We make mistake upon mistake upon mistake. And yet, Lord, you love us. Lord, we can't count ourselves worthy of that love. But Lord, you justify us. It's a free gift. Lord, you are the creator of the universe. And yet you care about little us, insignificant us. Lord, remind us of that in those times when our faith is waning. Help us to remember the exousia that rests with you and you alone, the power to do absolutely anything. Forgive us for the times when we thought we could manipulate you. Help us to remember who we're dealing with. Lord, you created the world that we live on. Nothing we need is too hard for you. Many times in your word, Jesus, you told people that their faith made them whole. It was their faith that made them whole. So, Lord, help us multiply our faith, Lord God. Let us not grow weary in well-doing. 
because you do expect us to do something. But Lord, help us to do those things in faith so that in due season we will reap if we faint not. Thank you, Lord, for loving us and for justifying us as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We thank God for God's grace. So we thank God for the grace that shows.